Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to History of African Civilizations, um, AFN 121, Borough of Manhattan Community College, Fall of 2021. Um, today is November the 9th, um, 2021. And with us today, we have a um, guest speaker, um, a wonderful sister, um, coming to us all the way from the island of St. Croix in uh, Virgin Islands. And um, her name is Senior Dr. Shenzira uh, Kahina. And I've been fortunate to um, have an acquaintance for um, a couple of um, years now. I believe we met um, maybe about two years ago. And she was a guest speaker in this same class um, last spring. And we're fortunately to, I mean, we're fortunate um, to have her uh, join us again today. Without any further ado, um, Dr. Shen, as she's fondly called, um, is here um, to give us a presentation to share um, some work um, with us today. And please let's give her a warm welcome from New York City, from Borough of Manhattan Community College from students in our history of African civilization. So let's welcome Dr. Shen. Hi, Dr. Shen, welcome to the class. Dr. Shen, uh, you have the floor. Looks as if you were bumped off, <laughs> but I'm gonna um, hold the floor before she logs back on. So, Last year for this same class, um, Dr. Shen um, shared a PowerPoint presentation as well as engaged um, students in the discussion on the Nile River Valley. And also um, she is a member and belongs to the Smaitawi um, spiritual um, group. And uh, she's the keeper of the Ank for that group. And in this um, class, we've discussed on a number of times um, about the ANC, the origins of it. And today you have um, a live person that will be telling you more about, um, you know, the meaning of the ANC, uh, the relevance of it in terms of her uh, group or organization. And also um, she's, you know, taught for a long time um, community education, also at the University of uh, St. Croix and uh, the Virgin Islands, topics on, uh, you know, African civilizations, topics on or discussions on the Nile Valley, um, Egypt, Kemet, um, Axum, Nubia. Uh, you know, she's um, well versed. So, um, I hope that you'll be able to engage her in discussion um, about Ethiopia, Ethiopia, about uh, Egypt, about Sudan, um, and any other topic of discussion on maybe her day-to-day uh, -day work, okay, with the Smaitawi organization and how she became uh, the keeper of the ANC uh, for that um, group. All right, so I see she's um, not yet back, but um, in the meantime, does anyone have any um, questions about who Dr. Shen uh, may be or about her work and maybe how I knew her, how I got to know her? Okay, so no questions. Um, I got to know Dr. Shen actually uh, during a Spirit of Peace uh, summit a year or two ago, and it was a meeting with um, diverse religious leaders from around the world um, to share um, and also to um, offer prayers from their various traditions, um, you know, for world peace. So she came as a guest speaker um, to represent the Smaitawi um, organization. Um, Shola is asking me if I'm a religious leader. 
well, I do participate in a lot of uh, faith-based interfaith um, activities, which includes uh, numerous um, religious leaders from so many traditions. So maybe sometimes before the semester is over, I may do a presentation uh, on some of um, those activities, but uh, Dr. Shen is back. Dr. Shen, can you hear me? We hope so. We hope so. This is, it was when you said all the way from the Virgin Islands and it went. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wish for anyone to think that that's a representation of the location. It's, it's, it's totally an experience regarding just internet technology affairs. And I'm very thankful, very grateful for the opportunity to once again join your course on African civilization and students I need and participants in general. It's very important that we operate with a tradition that allows for us to be very open-minded regarding what we have as preconceived ideas on African civilization and especially just on that concept perspective, the terminology related to Africa. It's very important from that vantage point because there's going to be things that I will share that may be very, very familiar. And there are going to be things that I may share that may seem somewhat controversial, particularly since we are highlighting the illustrious, majestic, and most right honorable life research publications and practices of Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanan, humbly and most respectfully regarded as Dr. Ben. And his tributes, his very extensive research in African civilization from a very African indigenous native perspective. And, I, and I'm gonna encourage you to take note to that particular idea and framework in which I am sharing information about the Honorable Dr. Yosef Ben Yakina. And for disclosure purposes, I will also add that was shared in my introduction, part of which I heard and part that I hope covered that I also serve as a longtime researcher around African civilization, but I'm also a practitioner of Per Ankam Smai Tawi, which is an ancient, for some people, they'll refer to it as an East Nilotic Valley civilization practice that is spiritual. It is not a religion. And it's very important that when people speak of this and refer to this, we're speaking of the house of life and the twinned regions that are within the house of life. And so that will also tailor and flavor some of what I share about Dr. Yosef Ben Yakana, as I had the honor and privilege during his more than 90 years to be under his tutelage, to traverse into places along the Nile. You may hear me say Hapi, which is the original name, Valley Civilization Regions. Uh, contemporary spaces like Sudan, Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, contemporary Egypt, you'll hear the term Kemet. And I've also had the joy and privilege of having him honored in one of the places he is known to call home, which is right here in II St. Croix Virgin Islands, where he was a student where he grew up in this very rich African culture nestled inside of the Caribbean, irrespective of it being within an American slash Caribbean space. And all of these things are very important to recognize because of his upbringing as a Falasha Jew, as one of the original Ethiopian Falasha Jewish practitioners, and also as a initiate moving into mastership within the OMS, which is a very ancient order of the mystery system. And again, I'm saying all of this so that persons recognize this predates 
fraternities. This predates what people refer to as the Masonic Lodge and other types of lodge systems, brotherhoods. And it also frames the way in which the Honorable Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanan, Dr. Ben, had been received as one of the earliest anthropologists, archeologists, social scientists that actually explored sites along the Nile Valley civilization areas. And we can see that there were, there's publications that he provided for us that are still available now where he did extensive research from the 1930s. So just imagine small frame, African man, very dark, one highlight, highly melanated, traversing through places like Egypt, Sudan, and just keep in mind 1930s, and then publishing, doing research, and making sure that the standards of excellence and intellectual rigor were in, were in place. The reason I keep coming to that is so that when you are speaking, reading, presenting around African civilization that you recognize that standards of excellence, intensive as well as extensive, navigate through the differences between intensive and extensive, research, your ability to share the research that you've given and your ability to cite the sources of the research that you're given are very critical when it comes to presentations, lectures, PowerPoints, prezies, et cetera, videos around African civilization. One of the things I always like to do when it comes to speaking about Dr. Bim is I also like to highlight some of the publications and I encourage you to take special note on some of the titles of some of his publications. And I pulled this particular list from a publication called The African Called Ramses, The Great and the African Origin of Western Civilization. Now he composed this particular publication in 1989. However, the research, the documentation that's inside this particular book is coming from his wealth of knowledge from back in the 1930s. So just keep in mind, this is more than 50 years of research that was compiled and put together. And I just want you to take special note to the titles. And the reason I'm going to utter them instead of just putting up a screenshot is because I want you to think, I needed to sink in, and then I want you to start to navigate the types of questions, the type of inquiry, places where you feel you could get more information about some of these things that the Honorable Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanan prepared. We, the Black Jews, and it was originally published in Spanish because he was fluent in Spanish because his mother was a Puerto Rican um, ancestry, right? And he spent much of his younger years residing outside of San Juan. And the original publication was done in 1938. I just want you to get the depth and the breadth of what was presented herein. Another title, The Rape of Africa, and the crisis in Angola. And now keep in mind that particular piece, obviously because it was around Angola, was prepared in English, but originally published in Portuguese. And that was in 1958. And I'm, it's really important to take note of these particular publications. So when we talk about African civilization in the context of the work, the research, the teaching, the publication of the Honorable Dr. Ben, that you can at least place a marker in regard to what element on that timeline around African civilization did Dr. Ben focus upon? Because obviously his area of expertise in contemporary times, well, let me correct myself. In the 20th century, persons would have referred to it primarily in the, in the sphere of social sciences, particular to history, certain amounts of literature, humanities, specifically archaeology, anthropology in the 20th century context, and they would use the term Egyptology. When it comes to moving into the 21st century, and again, remember in the 21st century, the research teaching publication began to be more prioritizing around practical deliverables, if you will, around the 
content around the theme and it was more technical. So even the words like Egypt have become more shifting towards chemitology or Hapi Valley civilization work. You may hear a person say Nilotic civilization research. And those are the areas that Dr. Ben was very proficient at. Another, and again, here are some textbooks that were published of, in, in New York. And I want to highlight that. And these were done in the 1960s. Africa, land, people, and culture southern neighbors and southern lands and again these were all prepared to really provide and again in the 1960s look at the year 1966 and remember what was going on in new york the rest of the country in the u.s and around the world in terms of a significant resurgence around African civilization, for some just black civilization, for some Egyptology, for others just understanding the entire pantheon of African civilization and its contributions to humanity in a very revolutionary black nationalist, if you will, framework. And it were sparks of revolutions happening all through the African continent, all through the African diaspora that scholars like the Honorable Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanan were at the center of. These were the, these were the libraries that we were blessed to be able to go and sit at their feet and be in their presence and just take note as they were speaking, as they were lecturing, even if sometimes they were very sharp, because some of some of us thought while we were studying in our colleges and universities that we were actually brilliant beyond measure. And we could question <laughs> some of these elders because you know we were in college after all and we know how to analyze and engage and debate. And one of the things I'm very grateful for, for being around persons like Dr. Ben, and I can add to that list, you know, there's Dr. Yo, uh, John Henry Clark, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, Dr. Uh, Gabriel Osai. There's many others around the globe that they guided us to understand that African civilization is changing how we perceive it, how we engage in it, how we show our respect to it and how we hold it up to a level of excellence, more correct standards of excellence and intellectual engagement. So that when we're speaking of Africa, we're not speaking of Africa in a negative context, but in a very balanced, harmonious, respectful context as the grandparent to human civilization, period. And it's not a question, it's just a given, right? Some of the other titles, and this was during the time when Dr. Ben established, because this is something that you'll start to notice when you research and start looking at some of the materials around African civilization in general, inclusive of what you're using, you know, some of the bibliographic references I've seen that your illustrious professor has provided for you just to give you guidance on African civilization. Many of these titles, when you start to read the materials and you look in the references, you're gonna see some of these same names of African continental, African diasporic. You'll notice for the purposes of this lecture, when I say African, I am not spelling it A-F-R-I-C-A-N. And you'll hear how I enunciate Afrakan, A-F-R-A, K-A-N, because I'm speaking of the flesh and the soul of the illuminated ones that come from the beginning of the mountains of the moons, where the enter, God to some, Hapi, listen to the name, Nile, dwells. When I'm speaking of Afrikan, I'm speaking of that empowered space and those empowering contributions to civilization. And I say it unapologetically. And it's very important that, you know, for those that may not understand that, we'll come to that a little later. But some of the publications and many of these, I'm sure if you have not heard of them, it's just important to take special note. Black Man of the Nile. And that was originally published in 69. And it had different iterations because persons were typing this on 
the old fashioned typewriters, which most people have no concept or clue of in 2021. So just, just imagine you didn't have the opportunity to do it in word processing and you're typing and you have to make your first impression lasting or else you're going to retype the entire page, the entire uh, manuscript. Another publication is African Origins of the Major Western Religions that was published in 1970. Africa, Mother of Western Civilization. That was published in 1971. The Black Man's North and East Africa. And that was co-authored with another elder, now ancestor, coming out of the Virgin Islands, Dr. George Simmons. And that was in 1972. One of the classic pieces that would help in some of the research that you are already engaged in and will allow for you to have a very wide breadth of understanding African civilization and its contributions. And I need to be very clear, it's practical, it's spiritual, it's educational, it's sociopolitical and holistic contributions to human civilizations globally is this publication, Black Man of the Nile and His Family. So I'm gonna pause there for a moment because that was originally done in the late sixties. However, the impression the actual publication came forward in 1972. However, keep in mind that these, there are versions you can find now that are completely digitized. And some of those links I will share for free depending on how you respond to some of the questions. So that's why I'm saying to you, it's very important that you listen it's very important that you compose a set of notes that will help with our discourse um, towards the end of this lecture. And also just for your own philosophical understanding, it's important to be able to add this to what you have already been exposed to in this class. It's very appropriate that in 2020, well now 2021, that students around the globe have a more scientific, framework in which to analyze, research, write, and hopefully publish around African civilization. I want you to really go deep when I say these particular things, because many times persons see African civilization as like a sidebar or not central to intellectual engagement and development. And that's so far from the truth because all of the systems, all of the institutions, particularly around higher education, have their foundation and their cornerstone coming out of African civilization. And it's very important to highlight that. There's one that was very controversial and persons have, to this day continue to challenge many of the concepts presented by Dr. Ben and it's called the cultural genocide in the Black and African Studies clip curriculum. Notice it was an entire curriculum research and study. That was in 1973. And that became a treatise, more specifically, that became a guide for how any Institute of Black Education, you know, IBE, any of the Black schools, the African schools concepts were developed around the globe. Of course, with you know, ties right here in the United States. However, it influenced the entire forms of curriculum impacting and being used for people of African ancestry. All of this discourse around the International Day for people of African descent, the International Year for people of African descent, the International Decade, for people of African descent, which by the way, is still in progress. I would love to ask by a show of hands, how many people in this class, just use your reaction button if possible, or flicker on your face and turn it off, are familiar with the actual theme for the United Nations designated international decade for people of African descent. And if you've never heard about it, just say that. Just show of hands, please and we're not using our reaction buttons. 
Never heard of it. Thank you. Thank you. You can put it in the chat. Thank you. This is very critical because this is going to help you understand why this discourse, this presentation around Dr. Yosef and Yakana becomes very critical. I'm going to, again, share a few more titles before I go into another area. The need for a holy Black Bible. And that was done with three volumes of research under one cover in 1974. Our Black seminarians and Black clergy without a Black theology. That was done in 1978. And again, he was doing a number of these publications under Alkabalon Books and Associates, with Alkabalon being the term in his research of the description of that area of what we now refer to as East Africa, Nile Valley civilizations. And you'll notice I keep putting up quotation marks because English is not all of our first language, yeah? And even though it's a language that we're using in discourse and conversation around our okay. work, Isotep, our work and study, it's for the purposes of the, that being the language that we all can agree, at least for the moment, that allows for us to understand one another. However, certain terms, you know, terms like Black, that has a lot of meanings to people. Terms like Africa, the traditional way it's spelled, A-F-R-I-C-A, different meanings to persons. Some persons think that Africa, the continent, is one homogeneous space and everybody just gets along and everybody's the same. And you've got thousands of languages, much less sub-languages. You've got significant differences in culture from the North to the South, to the East, to the West, to the Central, and all in between. And then you have this different layering of socio-political influencers that impact how African civilization looks pre, quote unquote, BC era, because there was a pre, and in our contemporary AD, I don't know, you know, and persons forget that. And some persons tend to see African civilization only through one lens. And when you say African civilization, people like automatically go into a space of enslavement and colonization not recognizing that African civilization for millennia, thousands and 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 thousands, and thousands of years was uninterrupted. And so that's what part of this research, some of this phenomenal work that scholars like the Honorable Dr. Yosef Anyakanon contributed to. And of course it was seen as controversial. And of course it was challenged because it was very ancestral and ancient, new to them, but not new to many of us that were just able to understand the resonance in which the work that he prepared was delivered. One of the publications I mentioned, The African Origin of the Major Western Religions, has been republished. And like I, I always tell persons, you want to get the most recent version because even the typesetting is easier to read. However, for those of us that looked at this work earlier, thank you for those links that are being shared, Dr. Remy. And it's important that we recognize that. You want to look and understand, you know, what does this United Nations designation of international, for international people, the International Decade for People of African Descent, IDPAD, what does that have to do with African civilization? The themes, that were put in place from back as early as 2009, right? Through UN General Assembly meetings, the agitation to some, and the revolutionary work and organization to others from the not-for-profit and civil society networks around the world, really promoting African civilization, helped the United Nations to frame a series of resolutions that started with that whole concept of you know, having an international year in 2011 for people of African descent. And by the time the year started and various activities happened, persons still didn't know that this was what was going on from the UN sector and how that influenced African civilization studies, research, publication, and more during that year. Granted, there were a number of other things happening around the globe, 
you know, the customary terrorism, the customary exploitation, the customary public health crises, et cetera, that persons just did not get to focus on an international year for people of African descent. In their infinite wisdom, the General Assembly on or about to, between 2013 and towards uh, the middle of 2014, designated 2015 through 2024, let me be very specific, January 1st, 2015, where various activities were launched around the world. And it is to conclude December 31st, 2025. And the UN designated that decade as the international decade for people of African descent with the theme of recognition, justice, and development for people of African descent. I need that to sink in recognition, justice, and development for people of African descent. It has a whole quite detailed expose in regards to what is supposed to be taking place around the globe to really assist and support the recognition, justice, and development for people of African descent. So I don't want persons to think that what transpired with George Floyd was the centripetal effort to move this conversation around racial equity and minimizing police brutality and rights of African persons. That was, not, that was an, an event, very untimely event, very hostile event and an act of terrorism, yeah? There were several others that happened before May 25th and I want that date May 25th to sink within. The fact that on African Liberation Day, Africa Day, as purported through the African Union and other organizations, that that day in 2020 was the day that that entire horrific event transpired with the execution of George Floyd speaks volumes. And it's important to navigate what transpired from that day moving forward and the impact, again, the impact on how persons perceive, understand, respect, engage with African civilization. Very important for persons to be aware of some of that, to be aware of how that is perceived and very aware of these observances. Because if many of you right here and you you know, reside, live within, connected to what about your, New York. And if you don't know, just imagine how many other persons around the globe have no clue, no idea that the United Nations designated 2015 to 2024 as the International Decade for People of African Descent. And it, many of the research materials that they use to do such are grounded in the publications, the teaching, the frameworks established by scholars like the Honorable Dr. Yosef Ben Yakano and many others, right? I'm gonna take a very quick moment because I definitely desire to just share my screen. It should work, it should be cooperative. Are you able to see that? Yes. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. Yes. So when you go to, and you can just go yes. to un.org. Yes. You can easily go to un.org and peruse through the site and see all the other. There's a whole section that'll tell you international days, international years, international decades. Many times you'll start to see the some of these observances because by the time persons learn about them, it's the end of the actual observance, which is also happening with IDPAD because there's been so many different crises happening between 2015 to 2024, with the current global pandemic being at the center of that and transforming even how persons, what decade is it? Is it the second observance of this that people do not know because we tend to just look at things on a surface level. And I, it's, I want to just kind of highlight this piece here because there is a very extensive multimedia library. You can find videos, audios, multiplicity of audio and video podcasts, 
PDF documents, resolutions, a host of reports that will help you to get a better flavor for what has transpired around this observance of the International Decade for People of African Descent. Persons were asking questions, something as simple as, why would they have Brazil, the story of slavery? You'll hear me use the term enslavement. I prefer to have a more empowering process. African persons were never born into slavery. I wanna highlight that. They were born into the process of the institutions of enslavement. And when we speak of African civilization and particularly ancient African civilization, chattel enslavement was not a part of that engagement. It was a different type of enslavement, a different type of trade and engagement, and definitely a different type of framework for how human to human were engaged, exchanged, participated in warfare. You know, the more contemporary, let's say in the last five, well now 600 years of the experience of what persons refer to as slavery enslavement was very different. And it was tied to colorisms, racism, sexism, classism to a level unprecedented and not very customary in ancestral times. So I just want to kind of highlight, you can go to areas that share with you about the World Day of Africa and Afro-descendant culture. There are sub observances inside of this so that there's a very wide range of research, again, grounded in the work of persons like Dr. Yosef Van Yalkinan that provide clarity on African civilization, culture, and more. The other portion that I wanted to highlight were some of the resources and some of the websites that you can find right on this site that will help to frame and strengthen the areas of research. And again, highlighting every one of these sites has a button or a link so that you can properly cite your sources. I'm gonna say that one again. Every one of these websites has an area where you, because they're expecting students and researchers and scholars to utilize these resources. And it's very critical that you just do not copy and paste, that you pull from these resources and you cite the sources and that you cite the sources appropriately, whether you're using APA, MLA, whichever format they're in. And so that you get in the practice of these are my analyses around this particular theme around African civilization. And these are some of the sources, the references that I've utilized and why. Very important, don't just start writing and just, well, Dr. Ben said this and Dr. Carruthers said that and Dr. Osai said this and Dr. I know her as Donna Richards when she was teaching in the US but we know her as um, Dr. Ani, no, right? Phenomenal social scientist, phen you know, unprecedented research around Urugu. If you're not familiar with Urugu, let me put that in the chat very quickly. It's a publication called Urugu by Dr. Marimba Ani. And again, I will spend some degree of time highlighting those these authors for you to start to percolate and critically analyze, you know, how can this information facilitate some of the work, the research, et cetera, that you've been involved in. I wanted to show a particular video, but I am not, I don't want it to buffer. So what I will do in case it gives us an issue, I'm going to put the link to this. Uh, this is a link where the Virgin Islands legislature honored Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinan. And you know, he was granted a very esteemed recognition on behalf of the people of the Virgin Islands. And there was a significant amount of research. He was still, we were very fortunate that he again advanced in his years, but he was still alive and amongst us. So we were able to deliver this resolution, share that with him while he was still in the living. Because you know, many times we wait until persons have become ancestors and then we just like praise them posthumously forever and ever and ever. But while they were living, we did not really engage. And that seems to be the call letters for those persons that contribute to this civilization work. I'm okay. 
you know what, let me come out of this because I don't believe I put in sharing sound. And I need for you to hear portions. If you have any questions as I keep going though, please put them in the chat. And if you do have a question that you'd like to be part of the presentation, which I'm open to, please just um, alert Professor Dr. Remy. And the most beautiful. The people here are, as Dr. Ben himself would say, burnt of skin. On the afternoon of our arrival on a sailboat called a Thaluka, Dr. Ben unfolded the story of the ancient civilizations of the Nile. According to a great high priest of ancient Egypt by the name of Hunefer, H-U-N-E-F-E-R, he wrote a papyrus. It's known as the Papyrus of Hunefer, the paper of Hunefer. He said, we came from the beginning of the Nile where God happy dwells at the foothill of the mountain of the moon. There are two places in Egypt, I mean in Africa named Mountain of the Moon. One is between Ethiopia and o Kenya and Tanganyika, called Kilimanjaro, means Mountain of the Moon. The other is in Uganda, Renzori. It also means Mountain of the Moon. His presentations have placed him in great demand by students and community groups, especially those of African descent. This is actually a segment that's sharing the work of another great ancestor, Gil Noble, who had one of the first publications in televised media around African civilization, culture, and heritage. There was a program called Like the Law of Opposite or Equilibrium. In other words, for anything to be balanced, they believe that it had a central point, a point of balance, and they were the extremities of both sides of that point of balance, whether it's up or down, and if it was diagonal, it equally was balanced and the hypotenuse. The ancient Africans along the Nile, as a matter of fact, saw their spirituality being scientific for the basis in the logic of mathematics. Not mathematics coming from religion, to the, uh, 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 but to the contrary, the opposite. That what you call today religion, an organized body, an organization for the benefit of spirituality, and we don't even see it that way, the ancient Africans did not use that term. It is strictly European and Asian and certain groups of Asians who have got, carried their concept, their theosophical concept into organized religion. As organized religion came in, they claimed the corruption to spirituality. I just wanted to take a moment there so that persons could, and again, I put the link so that you're able to, thank you very much. That particular video is pulling some of the extracts from tours that Dr. Ben led in contemporary Egypt, United Arab Republic, more accurately known as Kemet. And he was doing these historic heritage and scientific research tours for decades, like literally for decades, you know, from taking certain groups and certain scholars from the, from the 50s coming forward, uh, all the way through you know, the concluding years when he was unable, just physically unable to take scholars and groups to different areas, to different temples. Part of the footage that you were seeing, and it was just important for you to just get a visual of the expansiveness, you know, going to these, medical, these pyramidal sites, going to the various temples and, and literally walking inside of them and again, in the 21st century, there's many more limitations. In the 21st century, there has been so many restorative construction projects on these respective sites. The color 
of the persons that are being depicted has changed. The nose structure of the ancestral beings in these areas have been altered. The language of the metanature, and you'll hear persons speak, speak of the hieroglyphics, and the term hieroglyphics has a very different connotation because anytime you start to speak of Egypt or the Book of the Dead and these types of things, people do not understand the wealth and the richness of even these publications like the more correct term coming forth by day into light. Notice the difference. If you see a book and the cover says the book of the dead, you might not be as interested in looking into that unless you know the background of how persons present things so that people do not go into those areas of study. When you look at the Egyptian book of the dead, many of the translations, whether it's by Budge, Nathelson or others, you will see that when they translate those terms from that ancient language more accurately than better nature, not hieroglyphs, because that also brings another connotation of enslavement and anti-godliness and a whole lot of other negative connotations. We want to look at these things in their more accurate African civilization groundings as presented by scholars like the Honorable Dr. Yosef Benyakna, and we need to call it by its proper name, the Pert Emhru Emger, coming forth by day into light. See, that cover, you might be a little more interested in reading and studying and then understanding that that particular publication is showing you the trod, the journey, the spiritual experience of an initiate understanding more correctly, understanding, more accurately, living a life, moving into light, honoring the most high mother, father, creator. Very different connotation. Very different than just seeing something to the effect like the Egyptian book of the dead. This is time that takes you into a Halloween-ish type of, of, of construct and takes away from the truth, justice, order, reciprocity, balance, divine righteousness, and harmony. Get those terms. Truth, justice, order, reciprocity, divine righteousness, harmony, balance. All of that, all seven of those terms to simply speak of an African civilization grounding concept of ma'at. Really important, very different. And that's the core of many of the works of the Honorable Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinan. I want to share a particular quote from the publication that, as I'm sharing with you. And I think it's important too to highlight the close relationships that, you know, scholars like John Henry Clark, because again, if you're going to study African civilization, there's a number of works that you need to look towards. I mean, for the purposes of today, I'm focusing on Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinan. However, Dr. George Simmons, John Henry Clark, uh, me, so Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, Dr. Marimba Ani, there's contemporary works that have been done around African Nilotic Valley civilization by Professor Anthony Browder. You know, there's Mario Beatty, there's a, no, a notable list of scholars that can provide you with information. You have Neb Karaheri Shetapahuru who actually studied in those temples to share, and I want to highlight that, under the tutelage of Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinan, translating what's on these temple walls in African civilization spaces, right? And then prepared a treatise on the Per Ankh as an ancient knowledge system coming out of Kush, Nubia, Kemet. Very different than just saying, oh, my soul, we're going to study Egyptian civilization and we're going to look at the Nile Valley and we're going to start from King Tut and come forward. Because King, by the time they got to King Tut, that was like during the declination, maybe say it better than that, the decline. Imagine if persons were to, 500 years from now, measure all civilization that manifested in America based on what happened between March 2020 and March 2022. Imagine what that would look like and how much of the history, culture, heritage, and traditions that would be missed. And just looking at this thread 
for let's say two years in this space called the United States of America. That, I need you to think about that. Okay, let's come back into our 2021 frame. That's what has contemporarily been done when it comes to African civilization. Persons look at like one space, one tread. They don't look at the millennia upon millennia upon millennia of civilization, building, tribulations, challenges, negativities, positivities, and then develop a comprehensive lineage of what transpired. They'll look at one period. They might stop in Sierra Leone 1994. That wouldn't be a good story to tell of internal civil war and strife that completely ignores the, rich, the richness of African civilization buildings and culture and traditions and kingdoms and queendoms. I want like us to make sure it wasn't always the king that ruled, right? In places like Sierra Leone or in places like Nigeria. Don't just measure African civilization on what you see in 2021 because you would be missing out significantly, significantly on what has transpired in these African spaces. If you're talking about African civilization and you do not know anything about the physicist, engineer, historian, social scientist beyond measure, you know, beyond compare, Dr. Sheikh Anta Diab, originally coming out of Senegal. Then that means we need to have more discourse on these types of things. His name, La Otra. And I put these in the chat as a courtesy because I am sure you know, I, I did get an opportunity to peruse your syllabus for this course, and I'm hoping that you are taking some of the references, some of the recommendations for looking at some of the res respective references very seriously. It is critical, I'm going to keep saying it, it is critical that you take time to review some of this information. And to use these resources, you can use them in any discipline in, in your classes, whether it's for humanities, social sciences, physics, marine studies, the arts, nursing, medicine, any engineering, any discipline, you're able to pull and extrapolate a significant amount of data and resource that would give you a perspective and a frame of reference that probably would be unparalleled in some of your other areas of study. I want to use a particular piece on retrospect that Dr. Ben provided. And I am hoping that you're carrying your questions. Okay, let's see. I'm looking for a question, but I don't see one. So I will, I will just close with this particular piece and then I have something I want to share with you all. Oh, my, 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 my. Okay. You heard Dr. Ben make an utterance in the very short video around we came from the beginning of the Nile where God Hapi dwells at the foothills of the mountain of the moon. And he made mention and he spelled it out that that is a teaching that comes from the papyrus of Hunefer. H U N E F E R. Very important papyrus. Is also used as a precursor to understanding ancient Kemetic Nile Valley civilization, and it's so that you can have a better understanding of how to include that, how to envelope those civilization studies, etc., in contemporary times. There's a also a reference to the Rosetta Stone. You know, that seems to be another marker where persons are utilizing. That's why I chose for my background today to use the Dendera calendar, which is considered one of the earliest renditions of a calendar system. And not only a calendar system from month to month, right, with everything following a lunar rhythm, but also the symbiology that's inside of it to some mythology around what people refer to as astro science, astrology, and keeping in mind astrology interpretation of planets and planetary bodies by humans 
versus, or I should say complementary to, that's more correct, complementary to astronomy, the actual sciences linked to the planets and the bodies, the celestial bodies surrounding these planets and the impact on humankind, right? That dendera that's in back of me gives you all of that. So all of this Aquarian age, Piscean, so and so, Sagittarian, this, that, and the other, those are the Greco-Roman vernacular for those signs. And there are also kinetic or more ancestral African terminologies for each of these movements between lunar cycles from new moon to new moon, from full moon to full moon. And we can start to bring in other African civilizations in addition to what Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanan highlighted around the Nile Valley and bring that up across the Sahara and go across the Niger and speak of all of these other civilizations like the Dogon and their high priest societies amongst the Hogan that literally saw what we think is a big thing now with Sepedet and Star Sirius and the North Star. But these Africans were seeing these celestial entities without any support from NASA, without any telescopic equipment, but through very trained, very experienced viewing, vision, and natural sciences. That's what African civilization gets us an opportunity to, to highlight. So I, I wanted to use the piece on Ramses, but I realized that just in terms of time, I don't want to introduce something that I cannot complete. So I'm going to share a piece on architecture. When we talk about architecture, and it's really important when we speak of African civilization, that's one of the areas where persons get to see the types of construction building sciences that are still marveled at in 2021. Some persons are still trying to figure out how the pyramids have survived for millennia upon millennia upon millennia. Persons look at the Sphinx and are still navigating how to explain why is it the head of a man? Why are there paws of a lion? Why you know, the body framing of a lion? You know, what does that represent? And archeologists and anthropologists have shown that where they thought that this celestial construction piece on wonder of the world was designed within the last three to 4,000 years, which is interesting. It actually goes back more than 10,000 years because again, that's what I'd love about science. You know, the carbon dating, pretty accurate. What the type of soil sampling that has been researched, pretty accurate. So it's showing that there was human presence and engagement in African civilization that predates what some persons feel only happened 6,000 years ago or six days to some, yeah? And it's very important that we look at that. Abu Simbel was not only used for the worship of the god Hra Horaketi, but equally for the triad, the god Amun Hra, the goddess Mut, their divine son of the sun, the god Konsu, and the man in the light of God, I'm gonna say that again, the man in the light of God, or what did we say? The image and the likeness, Ramses II. The flexing of Tameri's powerful political and economic might in Nubian territory was well calculated by Ramses II in his planning, for it certainly served as the center of an economic concentration controlled depot where Nile Valley merchants all the way south from Pemwet Aksum, Meroe, Tanahesi, Taseta, and Southern Nubia met to negotiate with their commercial equals of Northern Nubia and also Southern Northern Tamari. I will venture to theorize that Abu Simbel was the greatest and most important engineering project by May and Ramses II in securing his reign among his fellow African monarchs who shared the sacred waters of the River Nile. It demonstrated the engineering know-how of Ramses II, also Tamerian ingenuity in general, and equally provided a springboard southward to Pemwet in times of military agitation. And I shared that particular quote from Dr. Ben's work, as I mentioned earlier, this is coming from the African called Ramses the Great II and the 
African Origins of Western Civilization. And it was um, developed by, published by Dr. Yosef Benyakinan in 1989. And I just wanted to put these things out first because we can easily sit here and go through a slideshow of, of pictures. It's just very critical that you begin to frame how does this information help navigate what you are preparing as part of your presentations, your PowerPoint engagements for this course. And I'm asking for your questions so that I'm hoping you're asking a question that will allow me to provide an answer that you can integrate into what you're going to present for your professor's final presentations, your coursework between now and the end of the semester. All right, so with that, I'm gonna take a moment, I'm gonna breathe, and I'm gonna ask you, so tell me what you heard. What did you get from what has been shared thus far? It could be anyone, but I would really appreciate if you would show your face, because all I'm seeing are the rectangular boxes with these beautiful names. Please, let's put our uh, video cameras on, please. Thank you. Do like I do, throw on a head tie, put a shawl over you. <laughs> <laughs> Be prepped. And um, have your questions ready for Dr. Chen. She's come to join us all the way from the Virgin Islands. And it's still working. Give thanks. <laughs> Give thanks. I want to say a special greetings to Dr. Freeman. I didn't see that you were there. So it's it's an honor to meet you in this virtual lectern. It is my pleasure. I'm here writing notes. You are amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I hope that the students that are on really cherish this moment. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Friedman. And um, yes, please let's um, have questions ready or comments uh, for Dr. Shen. Right, it could be a comment. I mean, I may mm -hmm. have said something that kind of threw you off or I may have said something. And again, I'd like to highlight that. I'm sharing this in the medicinal, healing, spiritual space of us exchanging knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. There are going to be things that you live by, perceive, have learned all your life that may be completely the opposite of what I'm sharing. And I respect that. And I'm asking you to do the same. So when we're exchanging, I'm looking for those types of questions that are open and it will help all of us to be in a place of understanding the importance and the value of African civilization, culture and heritage and much more. And I'm also asking in the frame because some of the work that I have been involved in, you know, whether it's at the Virgin Islands Caribbean Cultural Center that is nestled inside of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences at the University of the Virgin Islands, which is the only historically black college and university in the Caribbean. That's one space, but it's also coming through the lens of some of the other global work that I've had the honor and privilege of working through and towards inside of Per Ankh and Smaitawi, Per Ankh Comniversity Institute, as well as a host of other publishing, teaching, research frameworks. I'm also speaking to you on, in this regard, in a very respectful regard, as the vice president, soon to be president next year, of the Caribbean Studies Association that really focuses on this layer. Again, the priority is around Caribbean studies and looking at Caribbean studies through a very global lens and a multilingual lens. So we don't do our work only in English. We are expanding the work in these, you know, course in French and course in Spanish and course in Dutch and Portuguese and Papiamento in this region, because those are the primary languages in this region. However, in doing that study, it expands to this African civilization grounding because many times when we're looking at these particular areas of research, we tend to only look at it through a very Eurocentric lens and it's a very colonial lens. You'll hear terms that have been coined by scholars like Dr. Carlisle Corbin, who has served as a advisor to the United Nations, has served as a international diplomacy and public policy advisor in the Virgin Islands government, five different administrations. So just imagine all of what he had to do to study that, to then speak of colonialocracy in a very different frame. And it impacts how we look at education, culture, health, 
technology and spirituality in contemporary times. And it affects how we even educate ourselves and what we think of as those standards of excellence and intellectual rigor. I'm gonna keep coming to that. When you're saying what you're saying in your papers to your professor, if a professor ever tells you, I don't understand what you're saying, what's the other term? Ambiguous, big. Well, what's the other term? What are your sources? Or even worse, did you write this? Whenever someone is saying that to you, it's forcing your hand. Don't look at it as, oh, this professor doesn't understand me. I stayed up for 12 hours and I don't understand it. Don't come like that. Shift your focus and navigate to what was asked of you and how do you present high standards of excellence in your response. If you give a professor trash, the grade will be lower than an F. Did you get that? If you give a professor qualitative, engaging, researched, well-cited commentary, even if the professor doesn't agree with you, if you can defend what you're saying with some sense of logic, proper rhetoric, appropriate grammar, et cetera, you win. That's what African civilization and the studies therein are about, sustaining standards of excellence. Okay, share the question. Sarah, are you gonna verbalize it or I have to read what you put in the chat? I'm not worried, that's why I'm not talking. Oh, not understood, talking understood. We will read them. No, we do not wanna interfere. We want everything to be perfect. We want you to keep your job. I have a no. question for my paper. Did chattel enslavement only start with the Europeans? That is a very loaded question because in most research, I like to use the work that's shared by Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop, and I would have to pull to find a particular piece that's shared by Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinan to answer that response. Most of the scholars, or Dr. Jacob Carruthers, or Dr. John Henry Clark, that's why I talked to you about the work of Dr. Marimba Ani, because Yurigu helps to frame from a sociological, anthropological frame of reference, like how the mindset is when chattel enslavement is very it's gonna i'm gonna sound peculiar but since we're talking from ancient ancestral african civilization and culture chattel enslavement like the actual ownership of the body the actual body parts the actual soul spirit of human beings in this case melanated african descended people is more of a from the 13th, 14th century come forward. That is not the type of enslavement or the type of servitude that existed earlier than that and not inside of the African continent in that regard. You could be in war, let's give an example. Ah, all right, I'll use that one. Since we're talking of Dr. Ben's work, so when you hear people saying Nubia or Tasetai or Kemet and so forth, you're speaking of like Egypt more in the North and Nubia more in the South and around those areas we now call Sudan, uh, Sudan, Somalia, a little bit of Kenya, right? And those ancient civilization times, <coughs> it wasn't to say, and people probably will question me on this one, but it's fine. I, I like those kinds of engaging challenges. It was a different type of enslavement. It was a different type of servitude. I would be at war with you. I would win the war this time. I would command control of your warriors and I can integrate them into my military. And they would, over a course of time, and once they show their loyalty, their dignity and integrity to my nation, then they can move up or move down depending on how they engage. Their children are not enslaved into perpetuity till death. Fast forward, chattel enslavement, the type that was done specifically, and we have to highlight, when we say Europeans, I don't like to just put them all in one group. Just like when we say Africans, we have to be very clear because there's some African civilization, societies, ethnic groups that were very blessed to pretty much so be exempt and I want to highlight that they were not enslaved for a variety of reasons, many times because they were more powerful. 
They may appear to have been participatory, but they did not, it was very different. It was very, very different. And I, I would push for you to look at a book called Africa and Unity, Africa and Unity by Vincent Thompson. That'll help to frame some of that knowledge. You can look at some of the work of W.E.B. I know it's going to shock you. W.E.B. Du Bois. It wasn't just the soul of Black folks and the talented 10th publications. You have to remember Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois had a chance to be into just the soul of Black folks in the upper elite in his early years and phenomenal research as a social scientist par excellence. But by the time he was in his 60s, 70s, and 80s, he was moving in the direction of a Pan-African Congress that happened in 1945 that changed the whole trajectory and history beyond measure, right? But W.B. Du Bois's work, he has a book called The World, you get it right, The World in Africa. It might just be World in Africa, but the one I'm thinking of right now is The World in Africa. And that will give you like a little bit of information with some references for what was the difference between enslavement in the context of chattel, where you became an animal. Our people were treated, they were no longer human. The laws changed. Lynching was, was normalized and legal. And the exchange of body parts and when I, body parts still in the body. Nowadays, we're doing human trafficking, the body parts are being separated. That's similar enslavement, just a different flame. And you know, human trafficking is, you know, when you say human trafficking at first, oh, that's so sad, but it's enslavement. <laughs> at the end of the day, right? That's 21st century, clean up the words, yeah? versus just calling it slavery and chains and you've got collars around your neck and people getting raped and breeding on ships and very different kind of look. That's why when we say African civilization, we're speaking of the development of high order thinking skills and high qualities and standards of civilization that to many are just, they had to be aliens. They had to come from another planet. They couldn't have possibly been human, right? That's the difference. I hope I answered your question, Ms. Sarah. I tried to give you the you nice- You answered my question just fine. And you gave me a better understanding. Thank you. And Most thank welcome. you for resources. Of course, of course. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to go through, if I mess up your name, it's because you didn't tell me the correct pronunciation. Melvin Reese, share a comment, please. A reflection. I feel like I could use the book that you mentioned in my final, The Cultural Genocide of Black African Studies Curriculum, because colonial, colonialism had a negative effect. Um, Africans were so-called forgetting their history, their culture. They were being converted um, into Christianity by the white men. Um, it, yeah, it all evolves about colonialism, ideas of the African people being their lives, their livelihood being changed. I appreciate that reflection. And I would add to that conversation so that it comes across, because again, when we start bringing up these types of ideas and thoughts, our mastery, our ability to wordsmith is really critical. And, you, and this is where adding to your vocabulary, like I always encourage students, every course that you take, you want to increase your vocabulary by a minimum of 300 words each semester, each course, notice what I'm saying, because you need to be able to have a very diverse approach on how you articulate and express what you're finding. So even when we say things like colonialism and or the impact of Christianity, you need to be very specific because the concept of the Christ, the Kerast, I want you to get that very clear comes out of ancient African civilization. Yeah, yeah, very different, very different. And that's where you start to, that's where you hear me speaking about Nubia Kush. When you hear me speak of Kush, I'm speaking of Ethiopia. And that whole lineage of the Orthodox Ethiopian black church is grounded in Christian, as we know them now, values, systems, and structure but it's coming from a very African centric perspective. And their Jesus, their illuminated one, the Kerast, the one that comes through the light of the most high, right? Does not look white 
with blonde hair or Michelangelo's cousin, nephew, et cetera. So when you say those things that, you know, colonialism and Christianity and ta ta ta, you need to be really specific so that persons don't think that you're saying that all of Christianity is colonized and all of Christianity, et cetera. I know to some persons it is, and there's some truth to that. However, the ancestral rootedness in the values, the traditions, the teachings of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam even. And keep notice, I should put them in the proper order. Judaism being what considered the earliest. Christianity coming through the pantheons of Judaism. That's why there's such a closeness between Jews and Christians. You understand? If you're able to understand the Torah, the Old Testament, the first five books, yeah? And then bring that into the more extensive books and the Psalms and the Proverbs and Corinthians, Cancer, right? You can tell all of us were raised in this tradition, yeah? And then you break that even further into Islam, which had its more engaging upliftment, again, grounded in these African civilization entities and on or about like coming beyond the eighth century AD, right? Through the prophet Muhammad and others. So it's really important when you say those things that you give some detail so that persons don't think that you like are destroying and trying to dismantle the entire spiritual and or religious system, right? So that it comes across as you are an African civilization scholar and scientist, yeah? Thank you for that, Melvin Reese. And we move forward to, I'm gonna say Duncan, cause I'm not sure how to pronounce that first name. Is it Mikhail or is it Michael? Okay, you're turning on your sound. You're letting me know. I get to see your eyebrows. I get to see the side of your foot. There we go. Oh, he left me. Oh no, um, Mikhail. It's Mikhail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Would you share your comment or reflection? I know that we are on a time limit, so I'm trying to go through this swiftly because I know that there's another class coming. For, you all have other classes, etc. Yeah, we can continue the discussion um, for okay. as long as you're available. Oh, fine. Um, only okay. some students have um, classes okay, okay. and the yeah. recording will be made available to everyone. Okay, thank you. So if you have more information to share, you're certainly welcome to do so. You know, I could do this all day. So I just all day, I know, right? <laughs> I'm navigating <laughs> with the students that have like specific questions so that you can at least, I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity to kind of glean over what we shared today and to be able to highlight some other areas that would be supportive for the research that you're doing for this particular class. And also things that you can extend to other classes that you're taking as well. Because that's the intention when we speak of African civilization is to have the breadth and the depth of understanding and the resources, or at least the links to the resources so that you can begin to peruse and glean over those things and use them as they're most appropriate in your work. You know, I, one of the questions I didn't ask, so please, ask the students to just email me, what are some of their intended majors? Because that, that would have framed some of the things I could have highlighted on Dr. Ben's work as well, All right? Okay, Lee, is it Lee Kwana? You need to turn on yes. your sound. Yes, oh, okay. okay, wait a second. Okay. We can't hear you, but we can't hear you. You, oh, they're so expressive, but I can't hear you. Okay, you need to turn on your, there we go. Now we do, yes. I knew Dr. Ben and Dr. Joseph when they taught in the streets of Harlem. Many, I'm an older student. I know about Kemet, I know the real, <laughs> see, unfortunately, I'm not getting a shot, but I wanna go to Kemet. I wanna go to Morocco. So I don't know what the year's gonna come because you can't travel unless you get, well, actually, but my passion is to go there. I've been wanting to go ever since I was a little girl. I want to see the pyramids. My sister went. Matter of fact, on PowerPoint, you should see her pictures. She was in the pyramids. She saw the now. And um, that's what I want to experience. Noted. And you will. And it, it'll come in the right time. I'm very, very grateful that there's this type of interest because Persons are going, uh, the traditional forms of going, it just requires more time because of quarantine requirements if you do not, if you choose not to get the uh, vaccine. And there are other places to be able to get some of this research 
information from those that are going, because especially now, Zoom is one network, but persons are doing like live coverage at these sites. So the persons that for a variety of reasons are unable to travel are still able to have that experience. That was one of the reasons why I always encourage persons when I was sharing that short video on Dr. Ben, it's important to look at the work of persons like Gil Noble. One of the things that the oh, Like yeah. It Is series did like it was, is. it was, you know, I went, to, I went to school with some of Gil Noble's children. So it's like, we have this ongoing, right? So it was like, that's what helped to frame my ability to be engaged and, and being more diplomatic. Cause I was just like fire, like you're not teaching me and I need to know about my, right. And, and, and we, you know, Professor Noble was the type, especially with that, you know, and then uh, being grounded in the Jamaican culture, grounded in Caribbean culture, the way that we engage, it would be like over supper, over dinner, over usually food engagement. So persons could actually practice how to have the, this discourse around African civilization and culture and heritage and not have, you know, not to say we didn't argue, but he helped he and other elders at that time helped us to be able to craft, you know, what do you need to study? Don't come talking to me about that you want to discuss African civilization and you have not read anything since our last dinner meal. You can't just come here and talk out your neck, right? And it's like, and that's what I'm hoping through, you know, that's why I get so excited when Dr. Remy asked me to come because I'm, I, I have a lot to share and I've had to practice being able to say it so that students didn't leave from the lecture like angry or vexed at all white people, because that's not where I needed to go. I need them to go into a place. How do I study and engage more? How do I strengthen my skills of analysis and my skills of presentation and my, my rhetoric? My, Cause they, you know, little things like rhetoric that if you can't talk, people can't understand what you're saying, period. You have to shift, not to shift your argot or your accent or anything, but you definitely need to be able to express so that it's meaningful and that you show understanding, wisdom, and balance, and, and harmony, and what you're speaking of. I mean, I have had some discourses with some of my colleagues, and they are European, and they just didn't know how angry some people of African ancestry are because of what the system has presented. So it comes out as just fire and anger. And I had to explain, I said, these are persons that haven't had the opportunity and the privilege to practice how to say these things publicly. By the time they come in public and say it, it's through a lens of rage and anger, yeah? And so we spend a significant amount of time, you know, whether it's through the VICCC at UVI, whether it's through, and I didn't get to mention that earlier, you know, through organizations like African Views. And I encourage person, you know, Dr. Remy, I had the honor and privilege of coming to meet her through international organizations like African Views and a host of other, you know, African rural kingdoms and all these other, organizational entities, some tied to the UN, some tied to the African Union, and some tied to international bodies. So that when we speak of African civilization, we're doing it from a place of strength, a place that is grounded in integrity, and definitely a place that's grounded in truth. And not everybody's ready to do that, you know? So but some people, they go, they do go to Kemet, they go to the pyramids. And it's like, nowadays, it's just like a screenshot. My FaceTime, I went to the pyramids, da, da, da. they don't study what is the scientific systems connected to these pyramidal structures. They don't understand that they are not burial sites. They do not understand that these are geodesic sites that are placed in particular areas on the earth that we can measure down to the nth degree exponentially for particular reasons, they don't understand that certain pyramids and certain temple structures have connections to it, astronomical realities that happen every 22 years or every 28 years or every 2,650 years. I'm just saying, persons don't understand the science, the authentic natural science connected to African civilization. That's why I even mentioned about the Dogon and the Hogan, because if, if we're gonna study African civilization, and of course, you know, grounded in, in these Nile Valley teachings, yes. However, it's important to look at all of the riches of heritage, culture, and tradition that go through all 12 million square miles. I keep telling people that, 12 million square miles of the African continent. There is, it's a treasure trove in regard to civilization. And again, trials, tribulations, many positives, some negatives, you know, but persons tend to kind of go to that one thread. It's like you're gonna have the whole blanket better than that, a whole quilt that's got a thousand pieces on it, and you're only gonna to go to one box. 
and say that that represents the whole quilt. That's what persons tend to do when it comes to African civilization. So that's why I was really pleased to be able to start from a very humble space of the work of Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinah because there's a lot. There's, there's so much that that in a, I don't even know how you teach this course for one semester because that could be like a whole mm-hmm. year in itself. A, a, a whole year. Yes. Or more. You know, of course. And that's part of why I'm, I'm very grateful. I don't think I heard from Chanel. Chanel, are you in a place where you can turn on your camera? <clears throat> no, I'm still at work, but I was okay. going to ask a question. Please do. I was going to wait until you was finished. I'm never finished. That's what you got to understand. You can go on for all day. So you just share with me your question. Okay. Um, well, my topic that I'm studying is about um, necessarily Nubia and um, Kingdom of Kush. Um, so I just want to like ask the question, like what other resources, um, and I know I should know this, um, but besides like the internet, I would just like to know like what other books I can like go find, like in a library that can like heighten my paper. Okay. One of the things I'm gonna suggest first is that you come up with a question and I'm sure that the professor already did this part. So I'm just repeating, I'm just part of the choir. When you speak of Nubia and Kush, you're gonna also find yourself starting to talk about a space metaway. And you're gonna start looking at a very balanced matriarchal, matrilineal lineage that's going to help you get a more fine, a more focused question. Just saying Nubia and Kush can be, you can't even do that for a dissertation, beloved. You wanna navigate a question around Nubia and Kush so that that way you can, your research, your work will be able to help you to as you answer, it'll create that paper. So you, it's good to kind of develop a thesis statement of what is it that I'm navigating, you know, matriarchy in Nubia in the pre-dynastic era is going to be explored in this paper. Whatever, I'm gonna give an example, it doesn't have to be what I said, but whatever is of interest to you. The development of the circle of the scribes, the priest, priestesses, etc., will be examined during the legacy of Queen Nufutari. You want to make a statement, a question that's going to allow for something that you can answer in the by, you know, I don't know if this is a five page paper, you can do that swiftly, or if it's a 20 page research paper or whatever it is, you wanna have a question so that you can actually, this is my review of the information. This is what I am planning to share in in my research presentation. These are some of the key points that I will highlight. And then, you know, you have an area where you detail and summarize how that's done. And then you get to a place of conclusion and highlight. This is a one thread (laughs) and a 1000 thread count sheet. That's what you're trying to get across because it's very rich when you speak of Nubia, Kush, because it's gonna, you, you're, you, we're, again, we're using the terms that we know, but it's gonna start to use terms like Tana Hessin. You're learning about the different cities and the different governing bodies in each of those cities when you start talking about Nubia, Kush, Kemet, et cetera, right? One of the publications, the one that, would help is pre-colonial back Black Africa and the African origin, the African origin of civilization, myth of reality by Dr. by Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop. I mentioned him before, but you can Google from that name. And those two pieces spend a significant amount of time helping you to understand the, not so much the distinction, but what was transpiring in pre-dynastic era before the leadership of Namer, 4240, right, BC. So that you can understand the differences between Nubia, Kush, Kemet, et cetera. And that may be something that you may wanna just focus on. What is 
Nubia and how is it perceived in the 21st century? That's something that you can do probably in, you know, comfortably in 15 pages. And, and I'm saying 15 pages, so I'm, let me see, 250, 500, yeah, give or take 5,000 words, right? I don't know what your limits are. Is there a particular, I should have asked that question. I, I didn't go over that, Dr. Remy. Is there a particular requirement that you're asking of them in this piece? Um, for the final paper, well, um, from the midterm to the final um, should be about five pages, but for everything uh, from the beginning of the semester um, that they will fine tune would be 10 pages. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so definitely you wanna have a question so that you can keep it within that framework that the professor has, has established for you. And you'll be surprised on the types of pieces. So if you look for, and I, okay, did I put that? I probably did not. I knew it was something else I meant to put that, but I'm gonna put it here. Professor, Dr. Remy will be, be so kind. She will share my email. I'm gonna give you my personal, just so that you have that as well, or uh, speaks at gmail.com just so that you have that to, because and sending it to our speaks, that one is gonna to go to my YouTube page network. And in that YouTube page network, there are a number of programs that I would pull from Parent Oncom University's site that give you that information around Nubia Kush. And a lot of that detail, I always give, I'm, you know, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty engaged and astute. I have to humble to my cultural anthropologist engineer of a husband, Nebkara Herishetapahiru, because that's his area of specialization. So that would be a, the other source that I would suggest. And it's a simple email with your questions. And then he will either send you a particular article or he'll be able to give you like some finite materials that you can begin, you know, books you can look for in the library. I love hearing students say they go to the library. That's so wonderful. <laughs> that's wonderful. Oh, that's just reinforcing, but perfect, right? The pre-colonial Black Africa, because that's going to help you to understand. And you know, Dr. Diop is one of the most thorough style, again, an ancestor, very thorough on the distinction between what transpired in contemporary Egypt, what transpired in contemporary Sudan, Somalia, Kenya, and what transpired in contemporary Ethiopia. And that's important to know, because then whatever you write on, you know, you will be speaking truth to power. You'll be speaking from a place of knowledge and wisdom. And even if you write, because sometimes when you're doing this, it's good to put a question, even if you don't answer it, but just highlight, these are some of the questions that come up when we do this research. And that that's part of your continuum of research and your academic scholarship so that you can keep standards of excellence on high. It's important that you come across like that and how you write, because the way that we're looking at African civilization in contemporary academic circles in the 21st century is very different and from a very different point of departure than how it was looked at in the 20th century. Right. And you're fortunate because you have professors that even are open to you presenting like this. So that's that's part of the, the joy and privilege right there. Any other, thank you very much for that inquiry, Chanel. Were there any other questions or any other comments? Oh, perfect. My YouTube page is, I will share that with you because we do things on building legacy. And I, I have to giggle because people keep telling me, I think I went to your page. I'm not sure. <laughs> I said, and we're, we know we're, whoop. That's funny. I will probably quickly share that. I didn't realize that it was going to come on that quick. <laughs> so this is part of the work that we've been expanding to. Well, it's self-explanatory. It's 26 seconds. excited if that came across that quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's one space where you're able to see some of the things that I'm doing like more in a, in a contemporary setting. But more importantly, I am, I'm interested in 
once I get a series of questions, there's different online workshops, programs that I can connect you to so that not only myself, but some of my colleagues, some of my spiritual comrades are able to share some more detailed information. And then there's a host of other pieces. I mean, there's um, Nile Valley Civilizations by Tony Browder that gives you a, an overarching understanding of Nubian culture, Kemetic culture, and Kushianu culture. There's works by Dr. Enfamdishi Jehudimes, who I'm sure you, if you're in New York area, I'm sure you've walked by his stand between 125th Street and La Orca. Yeah, in front of you. Yes, yeah. I know him. <laughs> right. And I'm just saying, you know, these are persons that are like walking libraries. That's and right. in, in his case, he can also sell you the books because he right. yeah. has yeah. a multiplicity of publications around the Kemetic Nilotic mm -hmm. civilization um, pantheon. And I think it's important to uh, to know to know that you have that resource literally right in front of him. Of course, he's going to try to um, market certain things as well mm -hmm. to keep you engaged. And he's doing these courses ongoing. Mm -hmm. And you have right in, you know, right in the area, I need to stop calling it Chinatown, but that's how I know it, Chinatown. By the bridge, you have yeah. Baba Haru Ankara Samaj I mean, that, and all you need to do is make an appointment. And that's like a walking library, a literal sage, um, right in the midst. I mean, this is a seasoned elder who has been in this legacy, right. living the legacy, Absolutely. making his living within the legacy for for dec you know for more than almost sixty years now, and and he's still amongst us and strong and moving um, forward. I I would not be you know this is the Ost speaks YouTube page, but I also speak of I'm um, Dr. And from DC, there's a book that he has called "Spiritual Warriors Are he Spiritual Warriors Are Healers," and that is a what is you know people look at the paste and it spends a lot of time on explaining ancient Kemetic tradition and culture, but it also talks about how we heal through these things. It also speaks about the architecture, the astronomy, the different sciences, the agriculture that's connected to that. There's a whole section on Kwanzaa. So persons understand that Kwanzaa didn't just start with Dr. Maulana Karinga. And, you know, people are, you know, we tend to, in the 20th century, somebody creates something, we coin it after them. That's not necessarily the most African-centric way because Kwanzaa has its root millennia upon millennia upon millennia on harvest festivals and rites of passage and much, much more. You know, it's just been conceptualized within this contemporary post 1966-68 um, piece of what Professor Maulana Karenga has prepared. And it's important that you look at, you know, some of Enfandishi's work. Um, I did mention uh, Baba Huru Ankara Se Ankara Pita. And there's a story to that. And this is at the shrine of, okay, I'm saying shrine, but the name of the business is Studio of Bata. But there also is a shrine that Baba has been the keeper of for, again, decades upon decades. And I believe that if I am granted a minute, I could probably just pull that up very quickly so that you can see, um, I, I, I like for persons to see the studio of Fatah piece. And I'm also interested in persons being able to learn about, you know, the, the shrine of Fatah, because the shrine of Fatah is where you get an opportunity to get the knowledge and to pull from the publications. You know, Baba Haru whoopsie, has prepared a couple of different publications that would be useful for you in that type of research. I'm gonna pull from the Shrine of Ptah first, and you can just put shrineofptah.org. And this particular piece is around the 42 laws of Ma'at, which is an ethical code. And this ethical code is grounded in the higher education teachings of ancient Kemet. It's really important to get that, that everything was around like a university structure. The way that you receive your degree 
as a scroll. I don't know if persons caught that when it's coming from left to right, how the president of the university passes it on to you. That's all connected to Jehuti, you know, the divine keeper of, of wisdom, teachings, and intelligence. That's a whole other lecture. But I wanted to, you to just kind of know, so you can see the 42 ethical ethics of Ma'at right here from the Shrine of Ptah. And I wanted to go to the homepage so that you, and that was Baba Heru, you know, but it explains, you know, some traditional meanings of the Ankh. For persons that don't know these things, if you want to understand Nubian Cushitic terminologies and history and culture, it's important <laughs> to go to those spaces and places. Okay, I see you, Queen. I got you, Queen. I got you, Queen. Yeah, Dr. Chen, maybe you should um, share some of your Ankhs um, also, because we've covered uh, for a number of weeks on the topic. And I'm sure oh, students will be excited to you see know, from you. So my unk is a carrying unk because I'm an initiate. And this particular one was designed as part of my initiatory work as a keeper of the shrine of Ast, Aset, the divine mother. So inside of Per Ankh and Smaitawi, while my beloved husband is the keeper of the shrine of Asad, the divine father. And that's based on the work and the initiatory work that he's been engaged in. So this too was part of my work. And I'm very honored, very, very comfortable because this is what allows me to then do these other pieces in this intellectual academic space. Because I do spend significant time in terms of the research, the publication, the teaching and overarching engagements so that it's not like just this kind of, you know, kind of fluid just kind of out here engagement, but that we're actually bringing truth to light and power and strength that's grounded in truth, justice, order, reciprocity, balance, divine righteousness and harmony, those principles of my eye and keeping that in the balance and being able to converse with sisters and brothers that may not be in this walk of life. And it allows for us to learn from one another and to exchange and share and to learn how to be respectful and disciplined and engaged when we are doing these, these exchanges. When you start to see all of this pit fire and viperousness, that becomes reptilian and we're human and we're supposed to be higher than that. And it takes a minute because, you know, some people that's just how they know how to go. They just know how to spit fire and go up and we have to leave them in that space. And when the time comes where they can understand Ubuntu, they can understand that there's a balance in, in the, all of us moving together or namaste, the divinity in me respects the divinity in you. Cause not everybody's at that place or where we understand dua uinter, that I'm giving thanks and praise to the most high mother, father creator, or that I'm able to, if I think I'm getting too heated, I usually just take a deep breath, maybe a few extra breaths, so that I'm able to speak from a place of wise engagement and not from a place of anger and utilize what people refer to in, in the Pulse Institute framework, you know, people using language skills effectively, a technique, a strategy of gentle, honest, open, specific talk. They call it the ghost. If we can't do that when we're engaged in these debates or discourses or lectures or Q&A or questions and dialogue more accurately, because it's more like a dialogue, then it's best to move into a realm of silence until we're able to do so. And that's something that happens. You know, I'm, that's why you can ask me at any time, Dr. Remy. I am so pleased and honored to even be invited, you know, because you could have picked anyone and I'm sure you have a number of guests that come and to give me this opportunity to share with your students, your fellow, you know, your colleagues. I'm very, very grateful. I'm very, very thankful. And I'm, I'm looking forward to more opportunities to keep sharing. I don't know, maybe we can get a publication together out of this. If you're out up of to this, me. yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I, I see that persons have other places to go, but I'm really excited to be able to share, you know, uh, some different elements. I think it's important, you know, when we were talking about Baba Heru, Ankara Saman Sepita, I also wanted to make sure, you know, persons that are that familiar with his work and his presence, that's, the, those are the types of elders that you have, you know, that's a, he, he too was within that realm of Dr. Ben, who prepared Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanan's first Ankh was Baba Heru, Ankara Samaj of the Studio of Pata, the Shrine of Pata.
who prepared an ankh, a carrying ankh for the great works and research for Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. That's another source. You know, and while Dr. Ivan Van Sertima focused, you know, coming out of Guyana, focused more on the native Amerindian slash indigenous ancestral culture, he showed the connection to African civilization. You know, there's works, publications, and a host of photographs and other graphics and tours prepared by Professor Renoko Rashidi, a new, as a, a, what I consider, he left the earth too soon, but he did a lot in the time, you know, in those less than, wow, less than 70 years that he was on the earth. You know, so anything by Renoko Rashidi, Dr. Ivan Van Sertim, I've already mentioned, um, Dr. Marimba Ani, you know, uh, Professor Anthony Browder, you know, there are a number, and I'm speaking specifically on those that go into like ancestral ancient African civilization and culture. I mean, there's, there's many others that could be added, you know, whether you look, you know, Dr. Uh, Professor Mfundishi Chutimas, you know, I mentioned Baba Haru and I speak of the Shrana Pata because what, Baba Haru has done with the studio of Fata is he has compartmentalized how you actually begin to walk and carry these sacred symbols within the work that you do and how you need to understand these symbols. And I think it's important that you'll see Andrinka. So persons were like, oh no, he only does comedic symbols. No, all of these African ancient civilization symbiology, the myth teachings, the, the wise sayings, the legacy builders, are highlighted and you can go to that site and just get like a very basic, again, if you want more detailed information on Andrinka, of course you would go to more engaging sites, but here you're getting an idea of the symbiology, what the names are, what the descriptions are, what the basic meaning are. And these are things that we don't realize when you wear them, when you have them in your home as art, when they surround you, then you begin to empower your mindset shifts, your intellectual strengths are enhanced your ability to engage in wise counsel, teaching and more are enhanced, you know? So whether it's through, you know, uh, I think it's powerful because he does a piece on Andrinka. He does a piece on the Kemetic alphabet. You're actually learning the meta nature, very basic. You know, this is not a meta nature course, but just so the persons understand what these symbols mean so that we don't add any negative connotations to things that are just part of natural order and high science, right? And you begin to see that many of these symbols are very similar throughout the 12 million square miles of the African continent. And then we start to look at the entire diasporic traversing of people of African descent. It's limitless, right? But I, I'm just sharing some of these sites because I think it's really important and critical. Exactly, Dr. Kaba, hands up. That's a, and again, and he's giving you like, he spits fire. And he just like, oh, nonstop, pure fire. You're absolutely correct. You know, and, and again, these are persons, in this case, they're still here. And, you know, with the others, you're pulling from the publications and, you know, various literature, but some of these elders are still here. And you have even some young scholars that are bringing forth powerful reference materials, resources, so that you can have a stronger, point of departure when you're doing research papers for, you know, your respective uh, classes, et cetera. And even the presentations start to shift. So you're helping me to motivate myself to some other areas of, of study and engagement, right? I'm, I'm working on a piece now on the power of women during the legacy of, <laughs> that's gonna be a rough one, but it's okay. <laughs> of, of Nefertari, because many times people are, you know, we can, like even today, you know, it, it takes a minute to be able to, you know, Dr. Nateri Nelson, I mean, there's very, there, there are a large number of women that are doing research in these areas. It's just that those aren't the names that click, click, click. You know, it's kind of like, we remember Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, maybe Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. Some people forget Madam, you know, CJ Walker financed, you know, she, Ida B. Wells, these were some of the fine, you know, Mary McLeod Bethune. They were the money women behind the Universal Negro Improvement Association, African Communities League. And most people don't know that, you know, we, we, we just remember the men. You know, Marcus Garvey would have, we would have never known the greatness of Marcus Garvey's work had it not been for the connection to African civilization, teaching and publication by 
both of his wives, his first wife, Amy, Amy Ashby Garvey, who took his work and that teaching around the globe, literally into Africa, into Asia, all over the planet and throughout the Caribbean. And the work of his second wife that actually published his work, you know, Amy Jacks Garvey, and we forget that, you know, that we have all these powerful women doing this fantastic work. And we just remember the men. So I'm, you know, and you want to be gentle and delicate when you write these things and publish these things. I don't want anyone to feel like I'm, because I'm definitely not in the challenge of the brothers. I think that it just should be welcomed and, and engaged so that we can have these discussions around astronomy, agriculture, arts and sciences to govern the universe, you know, and architecture in a way that the cosmogony of African ancestral ancient civilization is inclusive. You know, when we speak of ancient African, la otra, ancient ancestral African, Nubianu, Kushianu, Kamatu heritage legacy, when you start to see that, you'll see that we're saying the Ankh legacy. Ancient ancestral African, Nubianu, Kushianu, Kamatu heritage legacy. Very different place of departure than just saying, we're gonna talk about the Nile Valley and what took place across the Nile Valley and how important Tutankhamun maybe had Shipsut, but most persons don't go to Taharqa. Most persons don't look at Namer or Menes. Persons don't really look at the power around Ramses, the first, second, third, or Nefertari, or some of the other rulers, you know, because that's, that's another piece that Dr. Ben's work really helps with, you know, giving you a chronicle of the legacies of the dynasties. And when a dynasty was losing its effectiveness or where the people were in need of a new dynasty, then it would shift, sometimes very peacefully. Sometimes people were sent into the ancestral realm earlier than anticipated, right? This is just, that's part of the course. It wasn't, it's very, it's very engaging. It gives us an opportunity to really expand the work to the highest level possible. So I'm, you know, I'm really grateful to be able to share, you know, some of these pieces. I know persons probably were like, well, she didn't do a slideshow. I'll send it to you. <laughs> because I think it's important that you get the information first mm -hmm. and then begin to unlock the connection to the particular temple sites and really go as deep as your intellectual engagers allow you to, to be able to receive, you know, the most progressive, the most positive experience and really learning to respect and sustain integrity and the discipline that's required to study and restore respect for ancestral ancient African civilization. So thank you again, Dr. Remy. I yes, you know, Dr. Shen, um, last, last year we, um, you came two times. So the second time you were able to share the PowerPoint, but right. uh, yeah, so um, it's a, it's a um, wonderful presentation. You know, the opportunity to actually learn uh, from a scholar, get all these um, resources. Um, one of the things we also discussed at the beginning of the semester and also periodically throughout um, the course of the semester is that resources are not easily or readily available. So when we have, um, you know, individuals or groups who have centers that we can go to to learn or individuals that are willing to do community education, it's very important to actually uh, recognize um, their efforts. So I want to thank you so much for gracing our class with your presence. It's been an honor. I look forward to the next times and, and, you know, for any of the students, you know, when you're looking at this broadcast um, and it's recording space, I am very grateful for the opportunity and I encourage you send emails, you know, share your questions, share your draft papers, you know, and, and keep in a mind, keep your mind open to the fact that what you're writing is not only for this class, it's giving you an opportunity to express your understanding and to be able to share because someone may actually have the same questions that you have. Someone may actually be exploring the same area of, of scholarship that you are. 
And it's very important that you let persons know that and allow your professors to give you some guidance so that you can perfect your ability to express using the highest standards of excellence in your presentations. And of course, keeping rhetoric, language, grammar, and your analytic mind on the highest level possible. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Freeman, thank you so much for um, joining us today. Thank you well, so much. This was amazing. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and opening up to a wider audience other than your classroom. It was amazing. I learned so much. Great. I was like feverishly writing notes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad that you recorded this because I can go back, you mm -hmm. know, because I'm like in the middle of uh, office hours. So that's why I had to come off and go deal with yeah. that at the same time. And Dr. Freeman, we should do something um, in the department, like a bigger event, not just for yeah. a class. Um, so maybe sometimes in the future we can um, get together and um, work on um, doing a lecture series for other faculty and um, university community. Okay, I welcome that. Yes. I will be doing a presentation for um, Voicing Poverty in the Humanities. And I believe that uh, CUNY has already opened it up for other professors within CUNY to mm -hmm. log on. But um, I'm doing a, a talk on uh, talking about poverty and empowerment um, and taking it from a place of, of servitude to a place of power that we don't have to, our destiny is not dictated by our past in poverty. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. So is it possible to share the link for that um, presentation? Yeah, I did. I sent it to Anna and, and Patricia. So they'll be able to do it so that you can log on. Oh, okay. Oh, that, sounds, right. oh, that sounds powerful. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you're saying that, so I just, for whatever's available for the rest of us that aren't with CUNY, <laughs> please. Okay. Please share because that's the you know that's the type of information that we're always People interested in looking forward to. We're always looking forward to those types of things to be able to share you know uh, equitably with our students as well and along with our colleagues. Many persons don't know this is going on you know simultaneously, and I think that that's important. You know, one of the things that I'm I'm putting it in the chat just so that the students have access. There were a couple of Dr. Ben lectures that would help them to complement like what I was saying today. And I think that it's important that they take a minute, look at some of those to like add to what, you know, was shared today so they can hear directly from him. You know, it's one thing when we're talking in general about what we do and, and how we have interpreted, because that's what it is. We're interpreting what we heard, what we studied, what we read. You know, some of us were fortunate enough. I mean, it's powerful to know that you have some students that had the opportunity to meet some of these people, you know, living, walking, breathing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, it's critical uh, that they learn some things and that they understand why there were so many challenges for these scholars like Dr. Yosef and Yakinan and why we don't have an opportunity to have some of their work like outside of professors like yourselves to in, you know, have that fully integrated into any discourse around African studies, whether it's African, whatever term they use, black history studies, Caribbean studies, Africana studies, et cetera, because there's so much to gather. There's so much to learn. And I'm just putting that out there so that as students begin to look at this material, you know, look at this information, that they get a chance to learn even more. You know, I'm, I'm hoping, I was trying to locate, uh, when I get it, I will send it to you, Dr. Remy, so that they can read the actual resolution. It's a very detailed resolution where Dr. Ben was honored in the Virgin Islands. And in that resolution, it gives the history of, you know, the, where he was born, who his parents were, so they can actually know the depth of this very powerful scholar man, husband, great, 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 great grandfather, all of that, you know, um, it was amazing. And specifically what the publications are that are primary and how they can add that to their wealth of their own bibliographic references for moving forward. And again, like in any class, because he was teaching persons that were, you know, into physics and engineering and architecture, in addition 
to the humanities and other areas and social sciences, you know, whether, and it didn't limit to archeology span and anthropology and sociology. It included linguistics because of his mastery of multiple languages. And I think they need to know, this is just one, and there's a bazillion others that we don't tend to explore that would help them to just not only do your five to 10 page paper, but to be able to begin to strengthen their critical thinking skills and to really understand that what we're giving them is a different layer of appreciative inquiry and project-based learning that allows for them, yes, you do this paper for Dr. Remy or for Dr. Freeman, but then I can expand on this when I go into another course so that mm -hmm. by the time I get to my senior year, I have an actual thesis that I could actually strengthen, defend, and publish. And if I choose to do graduate work, I have something to start from and expand my research and really be contributory on these areas, supporting African civilization and whatever their, you know, whatever their major, their specialization is. That's why I'd like to do these types of courses and these types of lectures. So that, yes, I get to talk about Dr. Ben, but then I get to open it up to that wider universal higher education thinking process so that they can, you know, strengthen their critical thinking skills to a very different plane that's exponential. It's limitless, right? Yes. I'm excited. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Very empowering. Thank you so much. Yes, everyone, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And, and it's been a wonderful, for me, it's been a great two hours. And I look forward to talking with you both again. Looking forward. Stay in touch. Here. I sent you uh, my email. I see. I will and definitely send you have contacts in Senegal. 